Hi, welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Harmony, and I'm here with Russell Case. I'm just getting myself ready for the Shabbos. How are you doing, Harm? <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah, are you? Yeah, yeah. It's um, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm just going to spend the next uh, 24 hours uh, prone. <laughs> Yeah. I, I used to not. I used to light a candle. That's not n- much different than any other day that during the week. Now harmony. <laughs> <laughs> so I used. To, uh, we have a. I think we have a, a another member of the tribe. On, yes, uh, we have a very very fun and special guest today. And if you Jay, haven't listened to my podcast on uh, Jay Brown, Jay Brown podcast, I also have should. a very kind of goyish name. How'd you come up with a name like that? Jay Brown. My goodness. Well, first of Are all, you, hello. Glad to be here. <laughs> did you go Pentecostal? What happened to you, man? No. Well, basically my name is Jason Brown, but uh, anytime I've ever moved anywhere, there's always another Jason Brown there. Exactly. And so Especially in when this I landed yeah. in Manhattan in 1990, um, there was already, or actually it was shortly thereafter when I started getting into yoga more around 92, 93, I'd say. Yeah. A little bit later when I started getting into it, there was another Jason Brown who was also a yoga teacher guy. Mm-hmm. Of course. So I started going by J Brown, J Pierre, because yeah. I was also mm-hmm. fancying myself a writer, and I thought that was yeah, yeah, very, very yeah. literary. Yeah. And he went by his his first and middle name, Jason Ray Brown. Oh. Yeah, good. And so that's and it just and all my friends always used to call me J. So I mm. just went by that, and then it became a thing. What does the J stand for? And I kind of like that, and whatever. And so it stuck <laughs> yeah. over the years, and. Um, <laughs> That's why it's yeah. J Brown. Cool. We, we were the Detroit Kaufmans and we, <laughs> we needed work, you know, and no one's going to hire a Jew. So we, we, hi- we went to uh, the Chapmans and we, ma- we married the scurrilous, you know, God forsaken case family with no religion, you know? <laughs> so that's how, that's how, that's how we ended up here. Are your people, your you're from out west, from California or something? Yes. I grew up in the suburbs of Los Angeles. My parents oh. were from were Brooklyn Jews. And they um, wrote for Hollywood, right? No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's the only way Jews ended up in Hollywood is writing. No, <laughs> no. My dad was an engineer. My mom was a school teacher. Wow. Um, How'd they end up in L.A.? There was must because they work. ran away from their family, which was oh. yeah. like a a family that held grudges and was quite vindictive. And I, to this day, I have a strained relationship to, to it still. Wow. Yeah, they were like the black sheep who, who decided they wanted to get away from the family. And so they went West. They just had enough of it. I think yeah. so. But you know, Harmony, you just found out that she's Jewish. <laughs> I'm not Jewish. <laughs> oh, it's just like a whole extended family. Yeah. Do you want to get into that nah, on the radio? No, no. I got to get used to your sense day. of humor. Y'all, y'all, I got to get used to it. You're it's leaving very, me behind, I think. They call it a very New York sense of humor, which is like a euphemism, like an anti-Semitic euphemism for Jewish humor. <laughs> That's what they call it. I think they call it that. But it's so fascinating. They moved out West. And then you moved back east. <laughs> She's avoiding yeah. the Jewish part. No, that's her that's, avoiding that. that <laughs> good for you. I'm well, helping this, him. <laughs> this is uh, this is true. I um, I went back east to study acting at NYU, oh. and I did reach out to the family when I got here. I thought I'm going to have my own relationship to them. I'm right. my own oh. person. But then they were they were horrible to me too and i, were, and oh, I yeah. realized why they left <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. and then i and had all other kinds of issues with them over the years i mean i i definitely uh, made myself available but i had to separate myself from my family to like figure out who i was like i couldn't they were not supportive of mm-hmm. the things that i needed to do um, yeah. to get well you know? do you have you heard that trope that um that when that for us, you know, third, fourth generation American Jews living in America, that we still hold this inherited trauma from patterns and from, you know, things that happened in the previous century. You know, do you do you buy into that at all? I mean, I understand the concept, 
and there might that might be true mm -hmm. um I think that if we're going to do that, it could be deeper than that, deeper than those cultural uh, markings. It could be uh, humanity on the whole and it's turned. So, you know, I mean, it doesn't, yeah. I don't identify at, at age 16. Um, I remember going to a high holy day service and I was one of those kids who was like a good kiss ass and I was like a drama kid. So yeah. like at my bar mitzvah, I didn't just do my Haftorah. I did all the Haftorah portions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, nice. cause Good I could you. memorize really well. Yeah. And um, so I remember people coming up and patting me on the shoulder. So nice to see a young yeah. man taking an active role in his education. Yeah, yeah. And I had all them fooled. And then when <laughs> I was 16 and I was like, look at, we were, I was looking at the prayer book and I looked at the translations mm. to all of these prayers that I knew by heart. Mm -hmm. and i was like i don't believe any of this what's no. this and i like wow. had this whole thing and i told my dad i don't believe in this i'm not going to temple anymore and he said neither do i but your mom does so you're going yeah that's <laughs> oh good gosh. enough and fake actually, it till you, you make what? it jay yeah but that was good enough for me as long as i didn't have to believe in it was for mom i was actually pretty cool with that and right. actually by that point my mom was already sick and stuff so yeah mm -hmm. it was okay for me to do it for mom right if it right. didn't if i didn't have to believe it yeah yeah and so you continued on that way but yeah, did you start I mean, searching for anything else to like fill the void or how did you i mean not right just... away i mean i mentioned my mom was sick and my mom yeah. passed away mm -hmm. um I'd like and, to, yeah, go ahead. Forgive me for interrupting. Uh, I I have this. I think this is a really important um, point or threshold in your life, and I just kind of want to yeah. dig into it. I I know you probably talk about this all the time in your own show, but you know, we want to introduce you to to our our listeners. I I just have this very specific image in my mind of you as a young man, as a 16 year old, and it really stuck with me of you sitting in your car outside the hospital while your mother was sick and you hadn't visited her yet. And this was, I think, going to be the last time that you were going to see her. I just wanted to know if you could maybe go into that a bit more about how you ended up in this car, maybe not hesitant about going inside well um i do talk about this um pretty often and you know I, there was a period of time where i started to feel very weird about it like mm. am i like using this stories about what happened with my mom's death as like content or something you know like material right. or something is it yeah. cheapening this um but what i realized is that and i call it I talk with people about this all the time. Like someone has like an in mm -hmm. to like why they care about yoga as much as they do or, mm -hmm. or how it ended up being the transformative thing in their life that it is. And without a doubt, my, my mom is like what everything I do as a yoga teacher is in her honor, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. this moment that you're asking about in the car, actually, I should say first, my mom, she initially had breast cancer, which she, I guess, technically was cured of because she didn't go into remission within seven years, mm -hmm. but then she contracted leukemia, oh, God. Um, which some, which could have been a result from some of the kinds of treatments that she got because they, they've got improved yeah. treatments over the years. Let's just say that. Um, but what happened was, is I was uh, 16 when she got sick the second time. And it was deemed uh, terminal. So we knew that she was going to go and it was just a matter of time. And mm -hmm. at that moment, I was like starring in a school play. I was like a big man on campus and just, you know, not really in any kind of emotional place to be experiencing what was happening in, in complete denial of it. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you know, my family was saying, hey, you need to go see your mom in the hospital, but nobody was um, forcing me. And I just like wasn't able to go. And there was that one time that you're referencing where I went to go see her and I like parked in the parking lot for like 20 minutes, but I didn't go in. I left. I 
couldn't mm-hmm. do it. Oh, you didn't go in that day. I didn't go in that day. Oh yeah. I didn't make it in. Th- the only time I went in was when I got woke up in the middle of the night and rushed there because they weren't sure she was going to make it through that night. Mm-hmm. And that's when I had uh, the last time I saw her, which, you know, for me, it's actually the specific moment that I can identify where uh, something happened that changed me uh, indelibly thereafter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was rushed there and I was in a waiting room and she was coming in and out of consciousness and they were waiting for her to become conscious so they could bring me and my brother and my sister in to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And I remember flashes of things. I remember the nurse came in and said, she's awake. I remember going into her room with my sister. I don't know where my brother was. He was not with us. Go in with my sister. My mom's in a, what I would describe as chaotic emotional state. Mm -hmm. Um, She was crying and she was saying things like, I'm not ready to go. Mm -hmm. And my sister um, broke down and ran to her and was over there with her. And I was standing back from her bed, just standing there. And right there in that moment, something happens there that I don't understand because I was a very like um, hyper kid. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, I might've even been diagnosed ADHD at a different time at certain times in my (laughs) life, you know? Um, But in this moment, a strange and uh, unexplainable calm Mm. came over me. And I went to my mom and I reached out and I took hold of her by her bedclothes and she stopped being crazy. And she looked at me in my eyes and I said, mom, I'm going to do great things in my life and I'm going to make you proud of me. (laughs) And I'm not going to come see you again. And I gave her a kiss and I told her I loved her and I left the room. And um, she passed away about a week later. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for me, like, whatever that moment of clarity was, like, there's no explainable reason for me why Mm -hmm. I, I had that and was able to say the exact thing that needed to be said in the exact Mm. moment that it needed to be said. Yeah. So that I could go through my life in a way and not feel regret. Mm. But that um, didn't happen right away. You know, like initially, like I went in a very bad direction, you know, like Mm. after that, I moved to New York to study acting. And I don't know if you know anything about acting (laughs) technique or acting training, but it's all about breaking you down emotionally so you can feel things. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was on board. I went full method. I mean, I remember Mm -hmm. my, my final project, my first year in acting school was like a performance art piece where I stood naked on stage and projected super eight home movies of my mom holding me as an infant on my chest. Oh my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's actually real. Yeah. You know I mean, I was like, I just wanted so completely to not feel the pain, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the problem was I, I, I understood that I have to feel it to heal it or whatever. So I was <laughs> yeah. feeling it now, but acting training doesn't do anything to build you up. Yeah. In fact, they keep you down because it's a meat grinder. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're familiar that's with how the I got arts to yoga. and their training. <laughs> the arts also. and their training. <laughs> so you, you know, but I mean, yeah. I don't mean, maybe that was a harsh way to say it, but no, no it's I, the it's, fucking it's real way. It is, what, it is art. And that's why we watch Hell's Kitchen. It's because of that. It's like, oh yeah, this is familiar. Oh, this is kitchen <laughs> well, art. In any case, it was, it was yoga classes in acting school. Mm. Yeah, that yeah. as a movement component. And it yeah. was just like yeah. this undeniable thing where I would feel better after 
even though it wasn't great, like I could recognize like that makes me feel better and nothing mm -hmm. else does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a really specific moment where I was like at my worst and I was talking to a friend and they were saying, what do you want to do? And I had like a list of things I didn't want to do. <laughs> and yeah. like, no, that's really not what I asked. <laughs> yeah. And so I could only identify two things. Well, I was playing my electric bass guitar, which I was had self-taught myself to play and had played in some bands mm -hmm. and um, yoga practice. Well, and my friend well. said, you got to do those things every day. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, that's a great idea. And so I just started doing that. And I was at Jiva Mukti Yoga Center on 2nd Avenue. Yeah. I just started going to classes and it was an amazing place. And yeah, it was. Kind of what what year was there. that, Jay? That was 19... Well, I, I graduated high, uh, high school in 1990. My mom passed with, you know, whatever, two years before that, 88. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished school in 94, but I started going to classes probably around 93. Wow. Yeah. 94. That, that's, our, that's our whole Shtanga community right there in that room. <laughs> yeah. All of them. They're all the big, they're all the teachers now. Well, later on, a little bit later, what happened was, is, you know, Jivu developed their method. They didn't have yeah. a method initially. It was right. just a whole bunch yeah. of eclectic teachers. I met Eddie and Leslie and all these folks there. Yeah. And then Russell. They, and what's that? Russell, Russell Kai. Kai. Yes, yes. All those mm -hmm. folks were there. And yeah. then basically what happened was, is they made it a method and they made it like mandatory to go to kirtans and stuff. Yeah. And a bunch <laughs> of people bailed including a teacher of mine at the time named Allison West, mm. oh, who yeah. I followed. I and basically mm -hmm. she had the space on Broom Street across from Eddie's. Wow, she's yeah. back in now, apparently, which is amazing. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. that's where I practiced for two years. Wow. Across mm -hmm. the street, there was like a dance space on the second yeah. floor across from where Eddie's was. So that's, I was there like three or four times a week for a couple of years in there. Amazing. Can, were you practicing a shtanga or were you practicing just no, eclectic? I mean, like, Allison still? had studied with the uh, Joyce's and then with the Iyengars and then had gone through Shivananda. And so yeah. she was doing this kind of like comparative, this school does this and this school does this. And that, I was into that. So okay. I had studied sort of indirectly through her. I went to like, I think two lead classes with Jocelyn. That was actually on the bra nice. at the Broadway space before yeah. they moved to Broome. Yeah. Well, um, but I couldn't get into the scene like I, the Mysore Eddie thing. I, I just wasn't into uh, Ashtanga in that way. I was like more interested in doing kind of a comparative analysis of different approaches and stuff, which is <laughs> yeah. where which is where Allison was at. Yeah. So I learned it in in a kind of not traditional way, you know. Can I just ask you first before we go deeper into this this subject? Because I think this is this is fascinating. This kind of um, the the camps you and and Harmony <laughs> talked about this a, 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 a titch on your podcast, but I want to dig a dig a bit more deeply there. I just want to know how and why you decided. You said that you were horribly dis disillusioned uh, uh, as a. Um, well, I just want to ask where that phrase, what that phrase applies to. Was it to the arts? Was it to the the process of of becoming an actor? Like, how did you shift away, and what was it about it that that you really said this is this is going to work better for me, playing bass and doing yoga rather than than acting? Well, I shifted away from acting even before I graduated. I moved from the Playwrights Horizons Theater School where I was doing acting and directing to the Experimental Theater Wing, where I was like rolling around the floor and doing Grotowski and like yeah. started doing, <laughs> that's where I fell into like this postmodern dance world. And I started right. going to contact improv jams. Yeah. And yeah. like, I didn't like words anymore. So I just wanted to like do movement. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of had already moved away from acting. I did 
for one year out of school, create a couple of performance pieces in New York. And then I, I spent six months in San Francisco too. So I, I dabbled for a moment in like the dance world, but it didn't seem like it had much of a future for me. And all my dances <laughs> were about how much I hated the dance world. <laughs> tell. That's the tell right there. Yeah. yeah. Someone was like, why are you making dances if you hate the dance world so much? And I was like, you're right. <laughs> so when I got back to New York, that's where I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to be an actor anymore. And I just started playing in bands and going to yoga classes. And I did that for a while until eventually yoga just became where I felt like where I wanted to be. And, you know, getting up, going out late on Wednesday nights to play for the sound guy and then being <laughs> toast in the morning for my class. You know what I mean? Didn't make yeah. sense. So I kind of let go of some of the gigging out and playing music. I still play, but just not in bands. Yeah. And mm -hmm. ultimately yoga just kind of so many things. And to answer your question about the word disillusion, like for me, that word came at this point where I actually got a lot of benefit from yoga initially, where I gained a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. I was able to like feel more like if I want to do something, I can make myself do it. And that mm -hmm. was like super important because I felt so out of control. But at some point I had a lot of some physical ability. Like I could do a bunch of stuff like handstand presses and mm -hmm. uh, teachers would always ask me to demonstrate that in classes. And there was this one class where a teacher had me do a handstand demonstration and everybody applauded. Yeah. And then <laughs> when I came down, the teacher said, this is what you're working towards. Wow. And, and in the moment, I kind of felt great about myself. I was like the only one in the room who could do it. I was being put up as like the advanced yeah. guy in the room. But on the way home, I was miserable uh. because I still had like this deep wound over mm -hmm. my mom. Like that hadn't really been healed. I could do these handstands, but I had chronic pain. I had massive pain in my body, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I was just in denial over because I thought pain meant opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, ultimately, it kind of at some point, I just remember thinking, if this is what we're working towards, we're screwed. This is so can't be it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I did almost leave yoga completely. Like at that point, I was like, mm -hmm. I think this is bogus. I don't think this does what they say it does. I can do all the stuff. And I don't feel well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I had this close friend, other friend who was also practicing with me. And he said, I think you're kind of good at this though jay like he knew me as like an actor and a bass player and he was like yeah. don't give this one up so quick like he <laughs> he because he thought i was i i'm forever grateful to him to this day no he's mm -hmm. like my best friend on the planet because he he felt like he saw something in me doing this that was important he said instead he said before you quit let's go to india together mm -hmm. Wow. So nice. We, so I was like, absolutely. And we yeah, saved yeah. up money and we traveled there. We just went for three months, mm -hmm. not to go to any particular place. Like we didn't even have a plan, just like a let's go guide and a backpack. And like, I don't want to go to any tourist places. And so we traveled around for three months. You're like, I'm, I'm going to stay away from all the people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the, the, well, all the, the tourists. tourists. Like, I wanted cool. to, I wanted <sighs> to, Um, I think part of me wanted to see if I would find a guru. And yeah. I didn't think I would find it at the Taj Mahal. No. You know no. what I'm saying? So no, it's pretty. You though. might though. <laughs> super, super good looking thing. I bet. <laughs> but I didn't go. I did not go to the yeah. Taj Mahal. But, yeah. but I did go all around and wherever I would go, I would sort of try to see if I could find a local teacher. That was my idea. Like who teaches yeah. the local people? Yeah. And I did end up finding like a lot of kind of frauds, I think, who were just trying to capitalize on <laughs> tourists. But yeah, I yeah, did yeah. find this one Swami guy in Rishikesh who he really flipped me around on some things. That was like a really important time meeting him. Swami oh. Saraswati. Yes. Swami yeah. P. Saraswati, which I feel is like, it's like John Smith, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> but basically, I, re I remember I was staying at this... Um, like Om Karananda Ganga Sadan. Anybody who's been to Lakshman Jula yeah. in uh, India is probably still there. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it went, is. <laughs> I went to the front desk and I, the guy spoke good English and I was saying, I want to, is there a real teacher that I can go see? 
And I really don't remember what he asked me. I wish I could. I don't want to make it up. He, he asked me some question about yoga and I, mm. I believe it was a test. <laughs> mm. yeah. And I knew the answer and he smiled mm. and he said, you must go see the Swami. He's down from the cave. He stays up in the cave most of the year and comes down during the raining season. Mm. Wow. So he met, sent me to meet this Swami. And for me, it was the first time I talk about this with people when they train with me all the time. Like, is the first time it was a situation where there's no drop in classes. Like, yeah. I came to yoga in the group yoga class context, you know, where there's like right. a schedule of classes that you can mm -hmm. go to. The Swami didn't have that. You had to have an interview with the mm -hmm. Swami. Yeah. And so I was very fortunate because there was somebody already there and I got to see their interview before mine. <laughs> and I feel like I need to tell you that. <laughs> Because it, it, it affected the answer it, to the question that I was asked by the Swami. Yeah, yeah. You know Being second so or I third saw, is always. I saw the person before <laughs> me go to the Swami, and the Swami said, "What do you want to learn?" And the woman said, "I have really bad posture, and I hear yoga is good for that." Uh -huh. And he said, "Yes, yoga is very good for that. You come to see me these many times a week, and you'll pay me this much." Right. And I was like, "Okay, this is the deal." So I go up to him, <laughs> and he says what do you want to learn? And I say, anything I don't already know. Mm -hmm. and he smiles really big and he says, you come every day. <laughs> nah, you have a lot to learn. Young man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really what it started out as, he said, do you know Don Yudasana Bopos? And I mm -hmm. said, yes. And he said, show me. And I did my biggest feet on my head variation that I could do to impress yeah. him. <laughs> and he said, ah, yes children also do very well yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it like Brilliant. was like whoa like he compared what was advanced in new york to yeah. like being like a child yeah, yeah that's right and then that's beautiful and, and then everything that we did after that was like the simplest like rotate your wrists and then you know what i mean like the simplest not challenging asana you could imagine but mm -hmm. then he would always ask me we would sit and then he would ask me how do you feel Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for like the first couple of days, he would ask me that. And I would say, well, I noticed the impingement in my wrist and blah, 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 blah. I was just like talking out my ass, like trying mm -hmm. to like impress him and show him I was a yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And he kept getting annoyed, kept getting really <laughs> annoyed. And he'd say, let's try something else. And then one of the days, like maybe the second or third day I came in and I was in a bad way. I'd slept wrong. My neck was hurting. I was worrying about what's going to happen when I go home came in he said how do you feel and i like snapped i was like i don't know how i feel and he like smiled really big and he said good mm -hmm. because i hadn't answered his question in days he kept asking me the same question All right and it really hit me in that moment i was like i know how to chant dietary mantra i know how to do all these poses i i have no idea how i feel I have no idea mm -hmm. I feel about anything. I don't know how, I don't know how my practice makes me feel. <laughs> yeah. And ultimately that became like the moment where I was like, okay, he kind of gave me this permission, which was you're going to decide how you feel and how these <clears throat> things make you feel. And you're going to determine your practice based on that, mm -hmm. not on some abstract external idea about mm -hmm trying to climb the eight limbed ladder to get to Samadhi. So I don't feel pain anymore or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's so nice. There was a, it's a really interesting dynamic there between like, um, you know, leaving the arts because you're kind of getting more deeper into the physiological experience of being, which is kind of what the arts are for. So you kind of go deeper into yoga for that. Say, this is an art practice now. And then getting into that thing and realizing it's just rife with bullshit and <laughs> uh, people and cultishness and pain and absurd uh uh accolades absurd accolades <laughs> and uh then like what the fuck am i what the fuck am i doing here this isn't why i was here in the first place and then you go and you meet something and you find something where it's like actually like about being really real mm -hmm. and that's just that's a really beautiful uh progression and and uh 
how do you then, so you, this is like uh, your first trip to India. This is where this happened? Yes, first and only. And, mm. and what year was that again? 1998. I went 1998, to- right. And then you, you go back to New York, New York and how do you take that experience and build on it by yourself? I mean, do you have a, how do you continue and maintain this relationship with this, this particular revelation? Well, I mean- First of all, I stopped going to yoga classes and only started doing Mm self-practice and gave myself permission to do whatever the hell I wanted to do. (laughs) Like I basically said, if I can't find a good reason for it, I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I ultimately also found my way to the teachings of TKV Desika Char, which was very Mm -hmm. impactful on me. Mm -hmm. Um, Something about what was being talked about in the heart of yoga connected to what this Swami was saying. The text to heart of yoga. Yeah. That, that, that that book had, and even in the practicing, because what happened was, is when it was no longer about being able to do poses or sequences. And I like let go of all that. Mm. It just all became about breathing. Like I was really into Ujjayi Pranayama and Desika Char teaches Ujjayi Pranayama as a central feature in a, Mm -hmm. I think a, um, unique way sometimes and it just became a slow flow slow vinyasa practice very naturally mm-hmm. for myself mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. i did meet a teacher whose name i'm always hesitant to mention because of issues but i met mark whitwell who's a student mm-hmm. of desika char and mm-hmm. he turned yeah. me on to a bunch of stuff huh. that kind of was sort of the source material but i will say you know there was a real process of letting go of doing jumpings and like changing my class. Like I had already earned a reputation for being a very kick-ass vinyasa teacher with like a good playlist. Yeah. And so I, (laughs) at some point, at some point I remember I was teaching my morning power class after I got back from India Yeah. and I did something that I just don't remember having done in the few years of teaching up into that point, which is I just looked into people's eyes and looked into their faces. Like, you know how there can be like a fourth wall thing when people teach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I just started really looking at the people while I was like barking out the sequence and they just looked so miserable. They were struggling. <laughs> they were straining. They were feeling shitty about themselves. That's what I thought. That's what I saw. I thought, yeah. Well, yeah. and I started feeling like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Cause I wasn't teaching what I was doing at home. I was teaching yeah. the other thing. And then I remember people came up to me and afterward and thanked me and told me how great it was. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I can't, this is fucked. Yeah. I just <laughs> felt like I, I felt like it was low self-esteem. And then I was just dumping gasoline on it as, and like, Like, okay, everyone stop, watch me demonstrate how good I am at this to show you. And then now you go, it just, the whole dynamic of how I was teaching the class and the way we were doing it just felt so wrong. And I just, I literally said, I'm not doing it anymore. And then a bunch of people who were my regulars got all upset because I started doing the same simple sequence every time, (laughs) which is something that I took from Ashtanga. I liked that it was a set thing that you could learn and do, you know, and I remember getting called into the yoga center owner's office Uh and the yoga center owner said, is it true? Like, you're now only doing the same sequence every time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's not how we how we market you. Well, and I said yeah. yes, but I explained to her about yeah. Desika Char and why I was doing this. And you know, back then it was still a different time. And she came to my class and she was into it and she actually ended up supporting me. Right. But okay. I don't yeah. think that that happened for teachers after me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like mm-hmm. I was supported at this one center. I'll shout her out, Lillian Mead. She had Go Yoga in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And she let me do it. What I basically did was try to take the teachings of Desika Char, which are really one-to-one based. They're not Mm -hmm. based in group class dynamics, but can I take these kind of principles of practice and teach them in a group class? Mm -hmm. And that's what I kind of set about doing and continued to do for many years. At some point it became a little bit strained because what I was doing was definitely calling into question like what a lot of other teachers were doing at the center. Right. Mm-hmm. So it did, I think at some point create some issues. And then I eventually opened my own center, which I had for 10 years. Wow. 
So wow. I could just do my thing and not have yeah. to worry about that stuff. Yeah, that's Boom. always the benefit of owning your own center. <laughs> exactly. You get to have your own show. You're right. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't have to listen to anyone. <laughs> I can just do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Teach the way I want to teach. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's it's interesting because I think that that's like for me that's always the such um the blessing in a way of the Mysore style or that self-practice style where you have that sequence of postures and even if you're deviating from the sequence a little bit as a teacher with a student it's really that like one-to-one connection you know where you can work with the student wherever they're at and help them you know find different ways of accessing a an asana or different ways of opening the body to help them get into a certain area more and it feels like always I love that style of practice and teaching because it allows that type of relationship where I feel like that's really what the yoga how people need to practice yoga or how it's best taught and learned because it becomes something that you own as a student you know it's your practice and it's something that you learn and you can do it anywhere and it's so empowering and it's not creating that dependency on the teacher hopefully if it's done properly right (laughs) The teacher's just there to facilitate your own practice and your own like if you're not, awakening. If you're not independent, you're dependent. Yeah. Well, I know that for myself at some point, you know, sequencing was a way to like distinguish yourself in the yeah, New York yeah. yoga scene. And, sure. mm-hmm. and I was good at that. I could come up with different sequences. And I have this memory of one night coming up with this brilliant sequence that I had for tomorrow's class and then showing up to teach it. And there's maybe like, I don't know, five or six people in class and maybe only two of them could do anywhere near where we would need to be to do the sequence that I came up with. Mm -hmm. The other four, it's like not even useful. Yeah. And I didn't have another plan. I didn't have a plan B. So what did I do? What I do, I taught to the two people who could do it and then just tried to be as encouraging as I could to the four who had a horrible class. Mm. And I thought that class was about me coming up with a sequence, not about what anybody learned that day or got that day. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so by coming up with a very simple sequence that's Mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want, like like you said, you can you don't have to stick to it, but by having the simple sequence and kind of doing it again and again, um, especially when I had people who came back again and again, they mm. would learn it and know it. Yeah. And then like you say, they don't have to know, look, look to me for the choreography yeah. and I can actually observe and offer them things on a more one-to-one basis mm-hmm. than I could if I was giving them a new sequence that they had to be following in the moment. Yeah, mm. yeah. <sighs> but you have, you have a good DJ name, so I'm sure you had some good playlists. <laughs> It's funny in the old days i would you know bob marley led zepp and we yeah. did all that but then it, it just became bamboo flutes and droning droning mm-hmm. instruments and, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. as time went on i yeah can i just ask because um probably a lot of our listeners may not um mark well maybe too far outside of the fold for them to to know can you can you uh just flesh this out a little bit on why that might be a problematic name to bring up in a, in a yeah, podcast i mean basically you know mark i uh, met him at a certain time early on in those early days of the yoga world before it got big and mainstreamed and mm-hmm. he really taught me um, about desica char and the krishnamurtis mm-hmm. and he really helped me kind of do what you asked in terms of how do i take that thing that i got from the swami how do I make sense of practice in life in the way that ultimately, frankly, did I feel largely heal that spiritual wound that we started talking about today, where yeah. I didn't feel uh, wronged by my mom's passing and actually saw it as wow. a, a blessing of sorts. Um, and that came through a, a, a bringing together of certain practices that I've learned that I do say are inspired by Desika Char mm-hmm. and certain ideas um, that I got through Mark. I, got, I can't not yeah. say otherwise. Yeah. Uh, I unfortunately, you know, Mark, he stepped over all kinds of boundaries as a teacher, I think, yeah. 
Oh, okay. And so early on in, before I should say, there was a time where I, at my center, he was involved with a teacher there. Mm. And at the time I felt that uh, it was inappropriate and I did confront him about it. And, you know, it's a long, longer story. You can go <laughs> read it up, but basically, you know, I confronted him against her will. The, the woman told me everything was fine, but I, I what, did not think everything was fine. Yeah. I ultimately broke ties from him for many years because of that. Because mm -hmm. I just felt like, I don't know, I wasn't cool with uh, what I saw. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, many, many years later, it kind of came up again when the Me Too thing first mm -hmm. came out. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to this woman again at that time. And she still was very much not, she was very much saying he was not a predator and she knew predators and he wasn't. So mm -hmm. whatever, I, I heard that from her and then he had a new partner mm -hmm. and she, I see, I liked her. She seemed uh, like a very, um, I don't know. I, I was very impressed by her. And ultimately what happened was, is there was a Desika Char celebration at Kripalu that I went mm -hmm. to and he was there and I recorded a podcast with him. Oh, wow. Having sort of been, uh, you know, a little bit estranged from him. And then when this woman- With, with Mark or with Jessica? With Mark. With, with Mark with, okay. Yeah. That's right. And when this woman, Christy Rowe, let's say her name, she saw that Mark was on my show. She got very upset uh -huh. because her, her feelings about what had happened between her and Mark had changed. Mm -hmm in the, in the time of me too. And so ultimately I called her and I spoke with her and I had told her at the time that I would, I would support her, you know, do you want to come on the show? Whatever you want from me, mm -hmm. you know, but frankly, I don't even, I'm hesitant because I don't want to get myself in trouble, but she joined some, a Facebook group, mm. um, I believe headed by Karen rain who had mm. been on my show, who I had talked to Karen already yeah. about Patabi Joyce, as you know, yeah. Yeah, And I believe that she was made to believe that I was not a friend and that uh. I was part of the problem. And mm -hmm. so when she wrote her statement, which wasn't a statement, she didn't write it as my, this is what happened to me. She wrote it as like a narrative, like as like a novel almost. Okay. With dialogue and all this stuff. Wow. And she, she recounted moments between me and her. Yeah. And, you know, I was so torn because I didn't, her recollections of those moments did not purport with mine. Mm -hmm. And I felt really like she threw me under a bus. But at this at the time, I, I supported her. And it mm -hmm. came out on my podcast against him because even though she was, I feel, wronging me, I was like, you know what? It was fucked up and I'm going to support her even still. But mm -hmm. as you know, uh, it was the early days of cancel cultures and it didn't matter... Right. There was, it didn't matter what I said. Yeah. And people came after me and ultimately I did tell my side of it or whatever, mm -hmm. which was the wrong thing to do in some people's eyes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. I lost a lot of friends because that was like my first run in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people who had been listening to my show for years and years and years knew yeah. me. Yeah. You know, I'm very radically transparent on the show. I talk about <laughs> stuff openly yeah. You know, and I make mistakes and I admit them and, you know, I'm not, it's always been that. Mm -hmm. So it was an incredibly scarring thing for me on a lot of levels because I did mm -hmm. learn important things from Mark. I did feel that he stepped over boundaries and wasn't cool with it. But I also don't think the way that that happened, the way we were doing that was healthy for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, this is a super interesting thing to chew on. And it's just, there's a, on a meta level, I wanted to bring up Mark. because I was thinking about the role of the listener sitting there. It's like, there's a little, there's a little red flag or a little, you know, a little pin. It's like, <laughs> oh, are we ever going to talk about that Mark Whitwell thing? And they're the, our listeners sitting there, they're on their yoga mat practicing on Sunday morning. <laughs> And they're like, are we ever going to get back to the Mark thing? What was know. that about? What was that about? Maybe I should Google that. And then, <laughs> and then Russell brings Mark back in, in so we can talk about that. And 
inevitably, just like we were talking about before with your mom, <clears throat> there's an element to the three of us using these stories as content for the podcast. And we're, um, we have this kind of bizarre responsibility where we're informing our listeners, we're entertaining our listeners. And do we also have a responsibility to be, to be right and to be truthful and to make sure that our listeners are speaking truth? And if they're not speaking truths, so we have to take them to task and attack them. And, and you know, you guys mentioned this when you were talking about, about Eddie Stern, for example, that like, you know, how much responsibility do we have to ask follow-up questions to make sure that, you know, like Mike Wallace style, you know, he's beaten over the head with, you know, you know, follow-up questions. And there's just uh, what you've just described with, with, and I, I don't, I, I hope I'm, I'm making a logical through line here. What you just described with Karen Rain and and your friend who was with Mark Whitwell is our is a fucking nightmare, <laughs> and it would be the, it would. I can't imagine a worse outcome as a podcaster is is this is like what you've <laughs> endured multiple times now. Yeah, that wasn't the worst time. I, <laughs> yeah, as I know, as I uh, as I read going through your website, like there was. Like, it, you know, just like the, the idea of like Matthew Remsky deconstructing the words and choices that I use, my perspectives on his pod, on his blog, like, fuck off. It's the last fucking thing that I would want to happen to me. Well, I mean, you said the name that dare not be mentioned, but <laughs> <laughs> forgive me, my daughter's reading Harry Potter, but, you know, yeah. for me, it's, I was friends with Matthew. He stayed in my home. No, wow. yeah. you know, really? he taught an Ayurveda workshop at my yoga center back before he was doing all that writing. I was very mm -hmm. supportive of him in the early times of his early work when he was first talking about somatic dominance. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very supportive of him. And here's the fucked up thing for me is I talked with him about Mark when that long before the whole thing hit in the beginning right. of 2020, like I... I reached out to him to ask for kind of like his advice. Right. And he knew all about it. And then when it came out, he acted like I was just another dick. He yeah. Didn't, he just, I, I had some friends. It just, it's amazing how when some of the things happened with the social media, yeah. way it kind of took over everything, the social media activism, how people I thought who had known me Mm -hmm. for years mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. so I, I have a very sore part in me over that mm -hmm. person because i don't yeah. think and since then he's just shown himself i feel to be um destructive in what yeah. he does and, mm -hmm. and I, I don't like that i mentioned to you in our show notes that i i i he interviewed me for about three hours when i was in san francisco so this is probably like 2000 10 or 11 and he just wanted to talk about ashtanga yoga and pain and like you know it sounded like he just seemed to have a relationship to pain that was complicated he didn't like the idea at all I was like, okay well let's just talk about what you know kleshas and koshas and the experience of it and what we're trying to accomplish because i was still really into pain at that point <laughs> and uh then he said fine and he's in you know i said well look i'll introduce you to to tim and Tim can get you on the phone with Kino, you know, if he digs you and it's cool. And I think, I think you're, a, you're an interesting guy with an inter interesting perspective. And then he interviews with Tim and then Tim puts him on the phone with Kino. And then shortly after that, Kino files, a threatens him with a legal warning with a letter. So we're going to have to file a restraining order if you continue to obsessively hunt me. And I'm like, now, Tim told me that, uh, fuck, maybe in confidence. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, I, I, I went back to Matthew. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, this is, you, you've, you've now abused my trust. And I look like a, like a dick now. And I look like somebody who can't be, 
who and not not to make the story about me but it was like <laughs> what the what the fuck are you doing and it's like it just seems so destructive and it seems so as you as you said and it just seemed like this is a a guy who was seeking out to ruin people like that was his that was his point of that was mainly his point of view i don't know i i definitely felt betrayed by him on a lot of levels mm -hmm. i think it goes back to your question about like what's my responsibility as a podcaster yeah. you know when i had karen rain on i really wanted to allow people to have a voice who really hadn't had opportunities to speak about things. And those mm -hmm. people were wanting certain conditions. Like I, I um, lit the only time I've ever let anybody have any kind of editorial control over the show mm -hmm. is when Karen rain came on. That's the only time other than that, I've always get final say about mm -hmm. what it is. And even specifically with Kino, I you learned a huge lesson with Kino. Basically what happened was, her PR person booked her with me when the aloe thing was happening. Remember she was having yes, her yes. corporate battle with aloe or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's PR right. person booked her with me. She did not know who I was or what the show was before she came on and we were recording. Yeah. No sure. one had prepared her. And I had told them, I told them what I was going to ask her. I told them that <laughs> I was going to bring up Patavi Joyce. Mm -hmm. I, you know what I'm saying? I, but what happened was is, she came on, I brought stuff up. I, I had Matthew in my ear, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like mm. I had him in my ear and I asked her very pointed, challenging questions. I think that I did it in a very respectful way. I wasn't like a dick to her. <laughs> and in some ways, you know, for me, it was a horribly uncomfortable thing. Like I don't normally do that in my podcast with people. I, I, when we finished it, I was like, I don't even think we can post that. To me, it was like so uncomfortable. I was like, I don't, I think she's really stepped in it. You know, I think it's going to make every, people really hate her. And I don't know why yeah. I want to do that. Right. And my producer, who's yeah. of a different mind than me, who is why he's my producer. He said, are you <laughs> kidding? This is the best episode you've ever recorded. Right. Yeah. He said, wow. the reason why is because you two do not agree, but you're both being incredibly respectful of one another. Yeah. You are letting the people have their views. This needs to be modeled. Right. And Beautiful. she sent me threatening emails from her <laughs> yeah. lawyers saying, if you publish this, yeah. And yeah. I, I checked with lawyers to see what, what, where I stood. And we ultimately went ahead and published it against her will. Yeah. Ugh. But then people came out for her in, on Instagram, thought she did yeah. great, which blew my mind. I couldn't right. believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she then embraced it and posted out on her Instagram account to millions of followers. Yeah, yeah, that's huh. great. Of course, years later, I think some people had come to her her workshop and asked about it, and she, I don't know, I got a very upset phone call from her years later asking me to take it down. Oh. But uh. I will say this: I will say this. None of these instances are as bad as the one that you're pointing to, which I'm like we're avoiding, which is the trans episode that I did. Oh, yeah. Oh, did you know that, about that? No, huh? I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that comes up on Google right away. <laughs> <sighs> I'm aware of that. Uh, what happened? Well, well, yeah, you want to tell him? <laughs> I'll, I'll set it up. Sure, I don't mind. Um, you can set it up and he can tell us the real story. <laughs> yeah, probably. The, the, um, the one letter that I, the one blog post that I read from a from the the one that comes first on Google, probably which is probably the one that was shared the most and shared most widely, was a, a lady who uh, uh, was offended uh, by I think the fact that the mainly the fact that the guest who spoke about trans issues wasn't herself trans, and how could she speak for trans issues? And so the the notion that this lady could have any kind of a uh, valid opinion uh, about trans issues or sexuality and, and the, maybe the, the, the difference between gender and sexuality um, was disputed. So like the, the, um, the legitimacy of the podcast was in dispute. I think, is that fair to say? Um, I guess that's one of them. Although I don't know that that's the thrust of what caused the, um, 
the can- campaign against me and the show around that <laughs> episode. Uh-huh. You know, basically, you know, we talked about being a Jiva Mukti in the early 90s. My first teacher there, her name was Kachi. And uh-huh. Kachi, um, years later, and it was like halfway, like, I don't know, a beginning of 2021, I believe. And, you know, I was not just with Matthew Remsky, but with just what I saw like illiberalism on the left mm-hmm. at that point where it's like, it was the beginning of where you're not allowed to talk about certain things anymore. Right. Like, and me saying, what do you mean? Like, we're not allowed to talk about things anymore. And Kachi has radical feminist views. She's, she, but she was bisexual. I knew her when she was dating a woman in New York early in the days, right. you know, she's, she had a trans friendly yoga center in San Francisco for years. She was one of the early people. Like she's always very active mm-hmm. in like LGBTQ community when I knew her back when, mm-hmm. and I guess as time went on, she took, ended up having these more, I guess what you call radical feminist views and people in the trans yoga community and people in the yoga community online on Facebook went after her. Oh. And so I had gotten an email from her. Like I was on her email list talking about how all these people were like trying to get to calling the venues and getting her workshops canceled. And like wow. this whole campaign, they kind of went after her because she made these comments about these trans issues. And so I thought, I felt like, fuck that. I know Kachi. Kachi taught me to be inclusive. Kachi taught me <laughs> to love people. I, I, you're telling me Kachi's transphobic? What are you talking about? Right. So I reached out to her, invited her to come on the show to talk about what was happening. I just now, weighed right into it. Yeah. <laughs> you see, I didn't, I knew that this was an issue, that there were issues, but I didn't really understand, like I thought, we both support rights. We support people being treated with dignity and respect. They mm-hmm. sh- I don't support any of this legislation that Republicans are passing. I yeah, don't support yeah. any of that. Yeah. yeah. You be whoever you want to be. Yeah. I thought that was separate from whether or not sex is a dimorphic phenomena. If there's a if there, this idea of biological sex and gender, like the blur between that, I did mm-hmm. not understand that. Yeah. And I learned very quickly because there oh. was this massive campaign against me for having yeah. her on the show, for platforming. Yeah, um, platforming. Right. Platforming That's what we do here. Turf views. <laughs> and that was considered hate speech. Wow. And it was considered <laughs> yeah. causing harm to the trans yoga community. Wow. And yeah. Everybody piled on. Yeah. People wow. who've been on my sh- Sean Corn memeing it out on Instagram. Ooh. And here's the here's what killed me about it is they came at me with demands. Yeah. All of which I was willing and happy to do, except one, which was deleted. Right. Okay. Two weeks later, I had a trans man on. I put a call out. Come on the show. Mm-hmm. Come on the show. Talk about everything that was wrong with the episode. Talk about everything I did wrong. Yeah. Let's all learn. Yeah. Transmain came on two weeks later. We did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did not matter. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It did not you're, matter. You're still Basically, to- I, I also did all kinds of off, off air work, meeting yeah. with people, different yeah. big figures in the trans yoga community, but it was all contingent on me deleting the episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just refused. And you know what really? was really the thing that sealed the deal for me because it was a moment where I almost did because it got worse. I mean, I've had attacks on me before, but this was a whole other level. I mean, wow. it was yeah. scary. My wife was like, went into therapy. Like my wife was really <laughs> upset and I felt shitty, but like it was on principle. Like all I had was like my ability to decide whether or not something stays or not not mm-hmm. someone else telling me i have to yeah that's the the really funny thing about it is that people are ask are asking you to no longer have autonomy over your creation well they also are saying the thing that really drives me crazy is is it's about free speech not just free speech but it's about like speaking and having conversations and opening up these issues and there's nothing that helps to open up an issue 
like talking about it and yeah it might not be done in like one episode yeah one episode or like 100 I mean, in fairness the correct in, way or the right way or the way that's going to make everybody happy it might but, take a few episodes to learn yeah but it's know. but to to say well you know let's have these conversations and then say but you can't have this conversation mm -hmm. to me seems like very counterintuitive because the whole point is to have the conversation so that we can all learn and grow and like understand, right? That's what I thought. Um, <laughs> and I, I would say in, I would say a, a little pushback only in that if yeah. I knew more, if I knew now what I, if I knew then what I know now, I would yeah. have done it different. I think I right. could have done it uh, in a way to avoid some of it, although probably not all of it, because mm -hmm. some people felt that even to have her on, yeah, right. it was, was the problem. And I do fundamentally disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And here's the real irony. And this is where I learned a really big lesson. And, and it's an important lesson in terms of like how things work on the internet and stuff. Because, yeah. you know, people think the show has this huge audience and it doesn't necessarily, you know, you get to see your stats of yeah. like who listens, right? So mm -hmm. I would say if I were to be really honest, probably about 4,000 people around yeah. the world who are like regular listeners, they listen every week. Some yeah. of them yeah, since yeah, the yeah. beginning, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And those are like my, what I would say listeners. Other people come in and out, listen to episodes or whatever, but like in terms of having an audience, it's probably yeah. about 4,000 people. Yeah, yeah, we're about a thousand. So when this all happened, the whole reason people were doing it, the whole reason so many people put out their Instagram, redid the Instagram meme and, and had podcasts about it, was that we have to get this removed because it's hate speech. People cannot hear this. Right. right. <laughs> and we have to protect our community from this. Right. And mm. the result of that was a quadrupling <laughs> right, of, of your audience. So many more people. That is, and that is irony by hate, definition. Like, like you mm. could not believe. Wow. Mm. And to me, it was just so like, they talk about intent and purpose. Like it, and it didn't line up, you know, it didn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. And ultimately, I just think that particular issue is just such a, there's certain issues that you can't, you really doesn't feel like you can have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, yeah, you, you really can't. And I would, you actually really can, especially on Instagram, have a conversation. <laughs> and I think that's might be Harmony, if you could speak to this, is that yeah. <laughs> the genesis of our show is our realization that we couldn't have conversations on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that was but what we definitely. could do is have, where are we at now? 200, we've had, we're in a 200 hour long conversation <laughs> about the issues of, of our Ashtanga yoga community. Mm. And we can go into depth and nuance and, and we can talk about how there are different facets and different memories and, and, and still like, we feel like we have to be really, really careful when talking about Batavi Joyce and very, and feel inclusive at the same time, we, we do platform people that um, love the man without reservation. And we wonder, well, will we balance those with, you know, other people who talk about their, um, their misgivings. Um, but it's, it's, that platforming it could be the 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 motivation reason for canceling our for canceling our show and starting a whole campaign <laughs> if if the if our culture willed it at any point and so you know flipped a switch and said and we too started again and Batabi Joyce was in the news again it's like okay this is it you guys are done and I could <laughs> I could see it happening. And do you, is that does that does that resonate with you, Harmony? Is that kind of where what's happened? I I mean I don't know. I don't think it was that well thought out. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just like yeah. I think I it was think, intuitive. Yeah. No, I just I think that that if you have an if you have people that are listening to your podcast, then it requires more understanding and more dedication, and it's not just like a fifteen second flick right? <laughs> you're like, yeah. you're like in it, you're listening for an hour, you're listening for maybe over an hour, right? Yeah. You're like really at least catching the nuance and the tone and 
and able to like look at like many yeah context and able to look at many different sides of of these issues and I just feel like it's it's a better way to talk about difficult things than to you know post about it somewhere or even like write a blog which you know might be misconstrued and it's it's interesting to have people also with different opinions and ideas because for me I I always feel like you know I don't hold the answer (laughs) to all these these you know experiences or problems or dilemmas or but but you do edit and so like we don't have David Duke on the show (laughs) you know the former Klansman from Louisiana no (laughs) yeah I mean I yeah we do have some editorial power but (laughs) I mean what I would say is that I mentioned I got I got like a a massive amount of emails and communications from people. And a lot of them were thoughtful. Majority of them were vicious, but there was one particular email, which sort of sealed it all for me. And it was Mm -hmm. from a, a mom of a trans person, trans youth, who was also Mm -hmm. a yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And she was basically saying, I listened to both episodes. I I think that you were misinformed in the first episode and it would have been better if you had done this, this, and this. I think the woman who came on your show is misinformed, but please don't delete any of your episodes ever. We we have to be able to like hear what other people think. I learned a lot about why other people view things the way that they view things. Mm -hmm. And we need this open dialogue. They're important, please don't ever delete them. And I just said, okay, that's it. And I, I made new policies around that. Everybody knows now I will edit. If somebody says something that they regret and I can edit it out for them, I'll be happy to do that. Mm-hmm. But, and I didn't want to, I used to want to get, catch people and stuff. And now I'm like, <laughs> no, now if, if I want them to be happy with what they, yeah. they say on the show, but I won't delete episodes. You can't yeah. come back at me later and say, delete it. No, yeah. they are testament of what was happening. I, you reveal yourself as you're saying, like I've learned if you don't script yourself, I don't script my intros and outros. I don't script the conversations. You record yeah. them and you put them out. You, re- you show yourself, you show your own limitations, mm-hmm. you know, early on in the show, interrupting people all the time. It's like, shut up, dude, just let people talk. You know, like <laughs> you, gotta, you learn yeah. about yeah. yourself. And I've yeah. grown as a person because of doing it, become a better yeah. listener because of doing it. Yeah. And now I think I'm, I'm smarter about all of this. Mm-hmm. And I do think that, you know, I am, I don't want to say self-censoring, but I'm being smarter about where I think my wheelhouse is, like where mm. I'm best to speak in. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's not a bad thing because, you know, yoga teachers don't know about everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm always so impressed when, when we speak to someone and they're always like, if you ask them a question, they're like, well, I can't really speak to that. <laughs> I'm like, wow, they're so like, yeah. they so know their own like little yeah. square that they're able to occupy. And, and I think that it is a bit of a learning, right? It is a bit of a, a growth. And, and I think it's a recent growth that our culture has had to really kind of I mean, when I say our culture, I mean like the global culture of, you know, people who want to talk about these issues and want to learn about different things and different people's points of view that we've had to kind of um, grow with and understand like, oh, like I can't really speak to trans issues. (laughs) Like I might have all kinds of ideas and thoughts and and opinions about, about things, but I can't really like speak to that issue in an informed way, right? And so that's sort of the- interesting boundary i was gonna say i i've come to feel that i don't a lot of times i'm not even trying to speak directly to those issues like i hold an opinion about them right because i sometimes i don't really know i'm just trying to learn i'm trying to take like the seat of curiosity and learning totally so sure. from that seat i don't i don't know at the same time there appears to me not appears there is an identity politics mm-hmm. pervading yeah. everything. Yeah. And I feel very strongly about pushing back against that, mm. honestly, mm-hmm. because I just think that sometimes, I don't know, when I see certain things being done in the name of inclusivity in a way that doesn't feel at all inclusive to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or when I see people doing things in the name of 
I don't know, other kind of grand ideas. And it just seems to me that often, and not even like I blame anybody, everybody is getting mm. co-opted for corporate <laughs> benefit anyways <laughs> yeah. or something, you know, but I do feel on some level modeling as a yoga teacher, not just like falling into this identity mm. politics wave is, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, there's something there that seems important to me. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's interesting. I, I, at the heart of the, the conflict that we were having a couple of years ago uh, with our Instagram, uh, uh, what do you call it, channel? Instagram? Account? Instagram account. <laughs> is the notion that you shouldn't be talking anymore. Oh, yeah. And so here you are, you know, or we are white, cisgendered, uh, you're a Protestant female. Uh, nobody really knows what I am anymore. And, <laughs> and are you allowed to talk? And are you, are you pushing out other speech just by having the privilege of being able to speak publicly? And that, that, um, when we think about it, it's like, well, if we push back on that issue of, of being um, uh, on that kind of identity politics issue, like, am I sliding into kind of a, 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 a MAGA uh, white supremacist thought? You know, I'm, and I'm like, now I'm anxious and freaked out. Like, <laughs> what, am, what can I say? You know, I, I don't want to be that guy, you know? Well, I've had a, a range of conversations with people about this very topic on the show yeah. in terms of anti-racism work in the yoga world. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are a lot of different viewpoints as in everything. And mm -hmm. I think there are occasions where, you know, privileged people are pushing themselves into spaces that they best stay out of. But I also know there are occasions where people are using their privilege and positions to leverage that mm -hmm. to try to move conversations in better directions you know yeah. mm -hmm. it's to my point like in all these things that happened people fighting about all this stuff and i remember just thinking when all this trans stuff was going on it's like if we want to help trans people let's give everybody health care you know like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. i live in the united states and yeah you know like just we miss the mark you mm -hmm. know like let's help people if are we do we want to help people yeah let's yeah. help people because we're fighting about this and this doesn't seem like it's helping people yeah. yeah, we should be on the same side. I want you to get the treatment that you need. I want you to have all the rights that you deserve mm -hmm. as a person. I don't yeah. want to deny you anything. Why are we fighting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a yeah. phenomenon that you're just pointing to where it's a strange thing. You know, I grew up in New York City in the 90s. I'm a totally like, I always was a left liberal guy, you know, like, and to now to sort of be feel like the left is not what was the left and now it's like a circle I'm the only place i hear <laughs> yeah. people saying sensible things are on conservative news outlets like you're saying <laughs> it's what the hell you know like it's it's that's that, that's that horseshoe theory of of politics yeah yes, where the yes. Yeah. extreme left where and the extreme right start to start, look like the same yeah. thing <laughs> yeah and then you have pat pat robertson and yeah. um becomes a socialist in a, in a populist in a weird way it was <laughs> so a kind weird. of a yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's been mind boggling. Yeah. yeah. It's a strange state we're living in. I, I want to ask you how um I really I really like your podcast a lot. I like your manner and I like the way that you, you go about doing it. There, to me it's kind of a it's a love child between <laughs> love child. Mark Marin's WTF and Dan Carlin's hardcore history. Like I feel you <laughs> there and that's in that yoga space between those two. And I, and I just want to know how, what was the impetus for you to start and what, what did you want to achieve and how has that changed to where you are now and what you want to do with it now? Well, first of all, I, I want to quote you. <laughs> I love that. I mean, honestly, I had a blog for many years. And in the blog, I was always wanting to push the envelope and write controversial stuff. It was in the blogosphere days. So I yes. did clickbaity titles for a while. And, you know, I, I did. I, there was a very active yoga blogosphere in the early internet days where mm -hmm. I met Carol Horton. And we like, we had all these cool common threads mm -hmm. and a lot they happened on our websites and then facebook happened mm -hmm. and everything went on to facebook mm -hmm. and 
those common threads were cool on Facebook for a while until those algorithms changed. Mm-hmm. And then it all turned into a toxic wasteland. Yeah. And <laughs> basically at a certain point, like you, I just felt like this ritual I had of writing 800 words a month, mm-hmm. I couldn't get to any kind of nuance in 800 words a month. Yeah. And I um, had been listening to WTF. And I really yeah. was into Mark Maron's podcast. You nailed it. You know, and <laughs> you totally nailed it. I literally said to my producer, I want to be the Mark Maron of the yoga world. Right. I said that when we started production meetings about doing it. I was like, Amazing. but it won't be him because it won't be comedians. But it was like, I liked the format. I liked the way he was in scripting the conversations. I liked the way he was looking to try to connect to his guest or whatever. Mm. Although things have changed over the years with Mark. But I think... <laughs> I was inspired by that. And um, yeah, I think also, I'll be honest, there was a thing, you know, we talked about my mom and Mm -hmm. I remember there was a moment and my producer was challenging me about it because like, you understand, it's great idea to have a podcast, but to like do it every week for seven years as I have now takes a certain kind of dedication as you Jesus. are learning yeah. as well, yeah. right? It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're learning. It's some Especially, real stamina there, man. Uh, real stamina. Seven so, years is amazing. <laughs> so for me, the reason where I where I attribute my stamina for doing mm-hmm. this from is that there, there was this moment I, when I was a kid, I used to talk to myself a lot. I used to have these kind of like extensive conversations with myself. And I had mm-hmm. this very specific memory of my mom like knocking on my door and asking me who I was talking to and catching me, (laughs) like talking to myself (laughs) and like initially going to be very embarrassed, but my mom making me feel really good about it and telling me like the most intelligent people always do that. Oh, that's nice. And then like really smart people talk to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So like for me, like when I'm like in my attic talking into a microphone by myself like that, it's like, it's, it connects to that. Like it's just something that mm-hmm. feels very natural for me to do. Mm-hmm. And it's really just become like my continuing education. I just get people on who I think are smart and cool and learn about stuff from them. You know, mm-hmm. I've expanded my yoga education so massively. And I think that a lot of people benefited from that. It's like a lot of people in their teacher trainings listen to the episodes because there's so many people who've been on at this point. And I think at some, it was amazing in the earlier days of the podcast, you know, I remember I emailed Eric Schiffman and he said, yes. Oh, and I wow. was like, I was that's like, amazing. What, what a get. <laughs> yeah. I was wow. Like, what? He, mm. he just had a Gmail address on his website and he said, yes. You know, to me, it was amazing. like, every, people didn't even know what podcasts were so much, but basically someone would hear one that I had done that they liked. Mm -hmm. yeah and then when they got the email they would say yes and so I think over the years at this point again now that the show's had a number of different controversies and when they google it (laughs) they see shit it's not always that's like simple as that (laughs) but I definitely think even in this last year I you know I'm doing this teacher training which has Mm -hmm. been this re-evaluation I did them for years when I had the center and then I swore them off because I really I don't know, I had a problem with the educational model we were using. And ultimately I've been using the podcast as a way to like fill in gaps and like in a way the episodes have been going with the training. So the people in the training and the episodes, it's all kind of like swirling together. And it's this huge learning experience for me. And then hopefully for people who listen. That's amazing. So do you have your teacher training students like listen to podcast episodes as part of the curriculum? I mean- they can, they don't have to, like, there's no requirements in my training. Right. Um, but <laughs> just show up. <laughs> that's based, although, yeah. or not. But I say, in any case, I would say, <laughs> what, what I would end is that, for instance, like, just recently, mm-hmm. I was, you know, considering yogic texts with them. Like, when mm-hmm. I talked with you on my show about Vedanta, yeah, it was because I had just made a module for them on Vedanta, you know what yeah, I mean, cool. or whatever. Yeah. Or, and then I did a whole series on Hatha Yoga Pradipika where I got three different viewpoints, one from Shivananda, one from Muktananda, and one from like Soaz scholar guy, you know, like, yeah. and then we all had a conversation about Hatha Yoga Pradipika and we all had listened to all three of those episodes along with the cool. module I made. So it's just become like, 
more resources yeah. mm-hmm. for us to learn off of, which is the whole idea behind the show. I think it's yeah. twofold. Yeah. One, continuing education for us all. Yeah. And also really, I remember the real initial thing and why I was so inspired by Mark uh, Marin was that I wanted to tear down the facades. Mm-hmm. I had been a yoga center for a yoga center owner for 10 years. I mentioned I had like all kinds of pain, even after I switched to the gentle therapeutic approach, mm. I had run myself into the ground so completely with this yoga center. Anybody who ever has had one knows because yep. you just, it's all admin and all mopping floors and shit. And ultimately <laughs> I was so broken. Like I was in so much pain, but mm. I was still keeping up all the appearances. Cause you know, you got to look good. You're the yoga teacher, you demonstrate. Yeah. And so some of the early episodes, if you go back and listen to the intros, I'm just like crying and talking about how much my body hurts mm-hmm. and saying, I'm in pain. And I know I'm not the only t- yoga teacher who's in pain who's not admitting it. And mm-hmm. I started getting like pain science people to come on and talk about biopsychosocial versus postural structural biomechanical, you know, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. like started like figuring out how to heal myself of my pain. So you talk about Instagram. Mm-hmm. And it was all about trying to like tear down this kind of image we have of yoga teachers and what the yoga life was and on the beach and all that shit. Be like, <laughs> no, are you kidding? If you're a yoga teacher and you're actually paying your rent, you are yeah. grinding the fuck out of it. You're, you're barely <laughs> making it. You know what That's I mean? That's right. And totally. I wanted to talk about that. I had the third person on my show was Richard Carpell after he had just left the Yoga Alliance. Oh, so wow. I wanted to talk about the the profession and, you know, basically what had happened, you know, I got to yoga in the nineties in my early Mm twenties. Here it is 20 years later, I'm in my forties. I got two kids. Yeah. The wave has crashed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Yoga works took over the market. Yeah. But then of course, everything collapsed with the pandemic. And now it's just, it's all every, every woman for herself. I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going on out there anymore. I don't think so much of it is gone, you know? So much, yeah. But I feel like my coming into adulthood was right along like the trajectory of yoga going into the mainstream. Totally. And I sort of feel like connected in that way. So the show has been kind of like an oral history in a way of Mm -hmm. that kind of like crash. And then now it's like, what are we doing now? And we're all yeah. talking about somatic movement modalities. And- <laughs> totally. mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's certainly like, uh, we wanted to make a histiography as well uh, for, for our, um, our podcast. We wanted to talk about, you know, people will get a, like, you know, the, the biographical approach that I take is kind of based on Terry Gross and, and Fresh Air on, on NPR and like trying to figure out how a person makes the decision that they do. Like I, I listened to thousands of episodes with my dad when I, when I was just <laughs> going around with him everywhere, he always had her on. And so I kind of based it on that, but also it, so our, our listeners would, would clue in to what yoga was like in a particular time in the East Village in the 90s, you know, or something like that. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it, I have lost the thread of where I was going. I was going to compare it to something else that we were doing with the podcast, <laughs> but, um, about. <laughs> but it was, again, it was, it was also just about um, hearing a, a person's particular point of view about why they, they struggled and how, you know, these practices could help them. But also I think it was like the like wanting to preserve a perspective and and voices from like older practitioners and you know like we kind of all three of us grew up you know in the 90s with yoga and it was it was pretty weird then but like yes. how much weirder was it in the 80s right yeah. <laughs> and, super... like, and and then yeah one one interesting thing cuz you brought this to mind when you're talking about it, was like like this wave of yoga I mean, how do you, how do you feel about it being so mainstream now? Because I mean, you know, we sort of have a very, um, what do you say? Like a reminiscent sort of nostalgia, nostalgia. Thank you. Mm. That's what I'm looking for about like, like those grassroots, you know, like when yoga wasn't just everybody doing doing it it. all the time (laughs) and like all these, you know, 20 year olds doing 
acrobats, even though it was a lot of 20 year olds doing acrobats, it just, I don't know, it felt different, you know? How do you feel about it now? I mean, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. I would yeah. say uh, on one level, I think it's, it's a phenomenon that's happened in all industries, not just yoga, where you had a uh, analog yoga world. Okay. So, and it was initially like yoga journal conferences where, you know, we were like in the basement of a Marriott hotel or whatever with no yeah. windows. Mm. And then there was Wonderlust where you could be like out in an exotic location with yeah. music and drugs and yoga. And like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? There, and then I even need with my own little niche, my own little gentle is the new advanced niche, yeah. was able to go on an international circuit. And there was all these yoga centers and, you know, there was opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and if you went outside to like, like in, in Australia, it was still kind of on the up. It wasn't, it hadn't crashed yet. So you could right. still get sick. I could get 60 to 80 people in a workshop in Australia, wow. but back here in New York, I can't get more than 20. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and as we were discussing, you would get into this problem where you can't keep going every year, every year and keep those numbers up. That's not going to work. Right. Yeah. Um, so then the pandemic happens and everything shuts down and everything's crashed now, you know, and everything's gone online. So everybody yeah. figured out, and I was already online. I jumped online back in 2017 when I moved from Brooklyn because right. my producer said, if you don't, you're going to lose contact with all of these people that right. you've met in New York. And I fought him. I was like, yoga's in person. It, it's not going to go online. He said, you're wrong. <laughs> and he was right. Wow. And yeah. Ultimately, so when the pandemic hit, I was already completely set up, uh, which yeah. is a huge uh, That's benefit. Incredible. Yeah. And so to me, now everything's gone online. And as is the case, a lot of it gets co-opted, like with Facebook, like at any point now, Zoom's going to fuck us all. I guarantee it. At some <laughs> point, it's going to happen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. It happens with every service I've ever used, whether it's MailChimp or Squarespace yeah. or whatever it is. At some point, the company that's awesome, that starts out as the young, awesome company who's going to yeah. disrupt the industry and do it like right for Facebook. the, independent, for the yeah. independent creator. At some point, they're going to get bigger and they're going to screw us too. Mm -hmm. You know, so to me, What's happened is, is like everything went online that the corporate world took that over too, but they, they left the real world behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've said this many times, I'm making a living off of an email list of 4,000 people right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know other people who have Instagram accounts with a lot more followers than that, who are, they're not mm -hmm. making any money off of at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So that it is really this, I don't know if you're familiar with this like 1000 true fans idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've ever heard yeah. that before, I certainly didn't invent it. But like, if you're somebody who is an independent creator or artist, mm -hmm. like a yoga teacher, I'm going to say, and you want to try to make a living off of that, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need a big reach of people. You need yeah. 1000 true fans. If you mm -hmm. have 1000 people who really appreciate what you do and want to support it, and will yeah. buy your thing that year mm -hmm. for a hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. You just made a living. Yes. And you can tweak <laughs> those numbers. It can be, you know, 2000 people for $50 or whatever it is. Yeah. But that having a, a Sangha essentially, like a mm -hmm. smaller community or Sangha of people who are just really interested in what you're doing rather than forever putting out energy to try to go out into the big world and have big mm -hmm. reach. Mm -hmm. To me, that that um, for independent creators, same like for journalists, same like for all kinds of different industries, mm -hmm. it's become something very different. And I don't think there's any going back to what was before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that I mean, to me, that that's very true. It rings very true. You know, even um, you know, even with like twenty thousand followers on Instagram, which isn't that much <laughs> actually, when you look at like you know, Kino with a million or LaRuga with, I don't know how much he has now, but you know, it's not 20,000 isn't a lot of people, but like also on my email list, I have about a thousand people similar to the podcast. And I mean, those are the people that really like support 
my livelihood. It's well, not hey, the 20,000 on Instagram or whatever, whatever it's worth, you know. I have this producer, Josh Citron, shout out to you, Josh, because yeah. he, he's the one who was in my ear about all this stuff. Yeah. And I, he called it owning your own digital landscape. And I remember when he was yeah. convincing me to get off of social media, because I got off social media like five years ago. Yeah, Amazing. And he basically said to me, he said, let's do it systematically. Okay. So I was posting out new podcast episode this week on all the channels, of course, right? right. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. And he said, okay, so what I want us to do is stop posting out new episodes of the podcast on any of your social media feeds. And we're going to see if the numbers go down. Right. Huh. And I was like freaking out. What do you mean? We got to promote the show. You know, we don't do anything. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's why we work 18 hours a day. He <laughs> was because of that. Exactly. So he, <laughs> so he fought with me, fought with me. And he said, just, he's like, well, oh, we can start doing it again if they go down. Okay. Sure enough, we stopped posting out. No change to the numbers. Whoa. Amazing. No change. In fact, here's the craziest. Increase in email subscribers on the website and sales. Wow. Huh. Because you people don't, you can't get what I'm doing on Facebook. Yeah. You have to go to my website to get it. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. Wow. So that's you amazing. Know, I mean, Love it was it. a process of elimination, like an elimination diet or whatever. But we, <laughs> we, we, we did prove it to ourselves. It was like, this is this energy that we put into making these posts. Does, and because even yeah. though you have those 20,000 followers, how many of those people see the thing that you it's post? It's true. It's you true. have no way of knowing. No. Yeah. So it, it's and a, they're it's always a changing the algorithm too, right? So. Yeah. In the early days, you could build followers in a way that you can't now. Yeah. yeah well. It's true. I agree. Yeah. And it's always it always feels gimmicky to me, like in some way. Like you have to, especially now on social media, it's just gotten like more and more gimmicky. Like you have to be controversial, or you have to like do funny dances and like be smart and cute or you know little just... text things pop up and you point yeah. at them or whatever <laughs> fucking stupid i can't i remember when my producer he's like you got to make a selfie video and i was like oh fuck you dude. yeah like, you gotta make a selfie and i did like two or three and yeah. i was like that's it dude i'm not doing these anymore when they first became the thing you know yeah. like i'm like selfie videos man no yeah. no not doing it <laughs> I, I guess what I've come to, and this is the, the deeper point, which you and I spoke about some yeah. Marnie, when you came on my show, is that in all this last two years, when it was no longer about trying to ingratiate new people necessarily, it was just about like keeping my sanity, you know, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I rediscovered aspects of my practice that I think had been downplayed, certain mm -hmm. aspects that I would maybe call devotional aspects or like chanting mm -hmm. Yeah. And certain spaces that I'm letting myself go to, places of prayer and places of like visioning mm -hmm. and like letting my intuitive knowing open up, listening to nature in new ways. And some of these things um, that I think previous to the pandemic were in me and part of my practice, but were not at the front of what I was doing as a teacher mm. because that would be making you weird or a culty person or right. religious. It sounds yeah. religious. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, it goes into that non-secular play or whatever. And I, for me, more and more have just felt like, okay, well, I don't care about that. This is yeah. what's important to me. Mm -hmm. And that's actually attracted new people, you know? So it's like yeah. resonate with the thing that you want to be or the direction that you want to go mm -hmm. instead of like, being in reaction, right, which is totally. actually resonating the thing that you're trying to get away from. Yeah. The the more yeah. that I I uh, talk about yoga in neurochemical ways, I felt like the more responsive the audience was, uh, certainly certain demographics, because some of them are really respond to Harmony's kind of more froofy stuff. <laughs> You know, but uh, having that neurochemical point of view <laughs> seemed to just really open up the whole audience. And I and I feel like if you can say to someone, "Well, religion is explained neurochemically," it's like, "Oh, that's that's why this this happens." Then the whole thing kind of makes sense, you know. And then you can even it can even become a um, 
a rationale for having a religion because you can see like what it does to you neurochemically. It's like, oh yeah, that really, that really works. Hmm. <laughs> but also consciousness is connected. <laughs> I need to see, well, why does it have to be, see, I get yeah. it. Like neurochemically speaking about things appeals to a certain kind of reductionist scientific mm -hmm. viewpoint that predominates, that makes people feel like it has credibility. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot, so many people were looking at yoga through this lens. Yeah. And I'm saying when you actually look at like yoga teachings, it's much more about this consciousness based reality and, and spirit yeah. and dare we say God, like, yeah. Harmony said God on the show. Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was He's like one of the sure. only people who uttered the word. <laughs> and not that I'm saying it has to be the word God, but the idea being that. Well, when you nail her down on what the word, what she means by the word God. Another story. <laughs> Another story. Right. Well, it's a, it's a very uh, all encompassing view. <laughs> Here's what I would say is from, and this is just my personal thing that. I feel like I got into yoga when it was weirder, like you were saying. Right. Yeah. It was, punk. It was, it yeah. was mystical. It was and mystical. It, and it opened up the idea of magical realms. Mm -hmm. And that was, in, I, that's where I live. That I believe that life is not fixed in the way that is generally presented to yeah. us. Mm -hmm. and I think that yoga does point us towards those understandings. Mm -hmm. And I think that those understandings do in certain ways subvert uh, mores that are in place mm -hmm. that are destructive of our mm -hmm. planet and of ourselves. And part of like this individual healing process I'm going on in yoga practice is like a micro for the macro healing process that the whole planet and all of us need to have together. Mm -hmm. Totally. So totally. to me, I, I think I just had somebody on the show uh, this week named Shamini Jane. And she like has this international organization. They do this research on biofields, mm. but she's like this science data nerd who, you know, talks about life force. I'm like, perfect. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. she's like holistic elements that activate life force and like yeah. finding ways to sort of scientifically measure that and prove that. Like you're saying, like, if you can talk about it in those terms, you can maybe make these bridges or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it certainly seems to me that there's something important there. I guess I really just been wanting to assert with some more confidence. Yeah. Some yeah. of what my experience of practice is, which does have to do with these aspects of contemplative practice and experiencing ourselves in these ways that do go beyond what we normally consider. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I love. I mean, I love that. I'm. I feel like I'm going more in that direction too these days, like trying to just tap really back into that initial um, love Mystery. for the yoga, which was very much tied to the mystical. Like, this is working, and I don't know why, but it works, right? And and it's even like chanting the mantras and and just tuning into that vibration and like this idea of raising your vibration, which then like increases sort of that field or that, you know, whatever, whatever kind of field it is, mm -hmm. biomagnetic field, you know, the heart field, whatever you want to call it, but that love current. Yeah. The love current. And there's some, there's some really interesting research. There's a, a place called the heart math Institute mm -hmm. and like that. It's just amazing what they've, they've like, also measured like about like our heart and our that intuition and that knowing before like our mind knows or our body knows like we feel it we have this like connection and and yeah it's like I, like I, I also just want to do practices that are like increasing that energy and that vibration and like connecting with people that do that and I think that's also what what people are attracted to too right is uh, more this serotonin, like elevation more serotonin less dopamine that's where really where we're coming from <laughs> exactly I mean again for me my practice my personal practice has absolutely evolved in particular mm. over the last year and it is definitely a de-emphasis of um, postures. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I've been doing for a lot of years, but just feeling even more confident about it. I do do breathing and moving practices with people, but the, the purpose of doing them is much more clear. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and it it's certainly not about a lot of like, like I'm just moving into that part of the training where we're going to be looking at practice elements like asana, pranayama, meditation, yeah. and things like that. Because we've been doing all kind of philosophical considerations. Yeah. So just like going back, I have footage of me teaching teacher trainings from like 2013 to 2015 of like, and just cringing at what I was doing because <laughs> it was just all about asana shapes and alignment and how mm-hmm. to make this go here and make this go right. there. And I just, I'm not interested in that anymore. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that serves us in the way that I thought, or I was hoping it would. Yeah. I, you know, I've said that to Russell forever, like ever since, even when I was on the, you know, out teaching workshops, you know, or on the circuit internationally, it was like, for me, I was always like, I don't understand why people want to come to an asana workshop. It's the most boring part of yoga. It's but I want so to learn how to do boring. Someone, it's boring please, to teach it. It's boring to practice it. It's like, why? What's wrong with these people? A handstand, please. <laughs> I'm like, I want it. I want like, to, why don't you want to come to workshops? I mean, but the truth is, handstand. I will make <laughs> way more money off a handstand I workshop I than know. I will off the, I know. you know. That's every what, time, um, every time. That's what John Scott told me when I was a young man. Like, you can, you can really make a lot of money off these handstands. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what it is that like that draws people to that physical achievement or that physical and accolade. Or I made a lot of money acrobatics. off those handstands. You did? I, I don't did. think you made that much money off mm-hmm. of them. Well, it's relative, isn't it, Harmony? <laughs> you used to date a banker. Thank you very much. You can go back to him. Stockbroker is different than a banker. It's a lot different than a banker, <laughs> as you like to point out. Thank you. I, I wanted to say it's really um, it's really awesome having you on the show. It's it feels like you could be um, like a little rabbi for us and how to go forward <laughs> and what to do. Like, you know, I sent you a script, you know, maybe I need to stop doing that. You know, you can help us figure out how to get guests. We're always like the last minute. Who the fuck can we get on the show? <laughs> You know, so there's a lot that we can learn from you. And I just, I'm just really grateful because what the last thing I want to learn is how to deal with a fucking scandal. But I think you can help us with that. So that's awesome. Hey, reach out anytime. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm pretty open source. I'm pretty open source with stuff. And I, I'm happy to pass along my uh, learned from my wounds to you, you know, to save you trouble if I can. Right. Um, I would say in terms of getting guests, I know what you mean. It's a, it's a process <laughs> of sending out those invites and you never know what I would say is if you, if there's somebody you like think would be cool to talk to and you're mm-hmm. like, Oh, but they've never come on. Send them anyways. Send them, yeah. send them, send them send, invite anyways. I sent Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, you know, <laughs> I did. I went for it. I fucking Aim went high, for it. You know, you right. Not and I it, did. You just never know. <laughs> you never um, know. He could <laughs> still say yes. Yeah. Good. And, good. and in terms of the other thing that we talked about earlier, like scandals and stuff, I do think that the dynamics have changed a lot. You know, um, I don't know that it is the same as it was even a year ago. Like, I don't know. Things have. Yeah. Yeah. They feel different. doesn't They, they? have shifted. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a reason why podcasting has become as popular as it has. It's, it's one up. of the, I don't know, vestiges in a way out here. It's like old radio on the internet yeah. and makes me think of like that Christian Slater movie. You remember Pump Up the yeah. Volume? Yeah, 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 pirate yeah. radio station. The pirate yeah. Basically, yeah. we have like our own little pirate radio stations. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that is, they're actually important. Like, Is it as I, big as a baby's arm is the one line <laughs> from that film that I remember. <laughs> well, I just know that I think that it's certainly for myself a rewarding project to continue to do for all the reasons I said earlier in terms of educating myself, but it's a meditation. I, I, I do it every week. I'm learning through it. And I think that it does, as we tried to have today together, offer these opportunities for people to connect. I don't know you two very well, but I felt like we connected nicely yeah. today. And yeah. there's a real thing that happens in there. So mm-hmm. that is why... Um, I don't write out scripts and I don't think you needed to write out the script. Like, I think you could have just come in with those notes yourself, like yeah. those, those bullet points. 
and we could have hit we, we hit most of them i think probably. we did we you know absolutely what I'm saying? Did, like yeah. that's what i do I, I will like make some bullet points about some ideas but i try not to stick too tight to them but um, I, and- I really want to give someone an opportunity to say look we're not going to talk about Remsky. yeah i true. appreciate that you put that that's in the script but we're not going to do that and I say, okay cool we won't i t- i got that i i appreciate that that you did that because if you're going to bring up names i i that was smart of you to do that because you, but I was fine to talk about anything. So, you know, to <laughs> me, I, I think that podcasting is uh, very vibrant in terms of mediums right now, more so than others that I've worked in. And you can see why, because you've been doing it for a little while. It does open up lines of communication and connection yeah. um, totally. that are different. It's the ultimate social media. Yeah. it's also very it's very social because it, we always feel this is like when we finish a podcast it's like we just really got to know somebody and now we're friends we with always them. really like them it was like that's, that's cool and that's very different <laughs> from like, like my cross, best friend now I love but like them. we totally. we could have done this like crossfire with tucker Carl- carlson you know we could have done that <laughs> but this is so much more beautiful yeah yeah me too yeah. i i i come friends with people who come on the show i i want to yeah. I think when you're curious and you you're interested to learn from people, there's a a lovely thing that happens in that. You know, it feels good. Mm. It yeah. does. Yeah, mm. I love your your Hunter S. Thomas vibe with your producer. It's very much Hunter like S. that. Thompson. We're like these. Thompson. I mean, yeah, Hunter we're S. Like these, with the we're lawyer. Like these two yeah. guys with laptops, my producer. basically. But... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But he, to my he, producer. He, he um. He was on a team of people who wrote the hook for Dora Explorer. Dora the oh, Explorer. Wow. And cool. he kind of early on quit it because he watched it go from like a soul project to like a Nickelodeon money-making machine. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he kind That's... of saw first how, how independent creators were getting jacked. Yeah. And he kind of kind of became... want a piece of that money though. That's he, I mean, he he had a piece of that money, but then he took it and he became an independent producer and kind okay. of on this mission to like expose these problems to people long before we all knew they were here, you know. Like yeah. he, he was somebody who had come to my class and met me, and he just sort of somebody who I've been like fighting with for years, and he was just right about some key shit. And yeah, Amazing. and I think that those people are invaluable sometimes, you know, someone who had perspective on what was happening with industry and with digital landscape in a way that I didn't, who had been helped in practice with me. Mm-hmm. And um, wow. we've become very close friends. So I'm very grateful for him. It's beautiful. Awesome. I spent a lot of time watching Dora the Explorer in my <laughs> my 30s with my child <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 beautiful well, well thank you so much and tell everyone where they can find you if they don't know yet already yeah they can find everything i'm doing at jbrownyoga.com great okay. yeah awesome all the amazing podcast episodes are there as is harmony slayer seven years worth <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, I think I just did my 325th episode. Wow. wow. We got great. 200 more to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> and we're Good luck. Forwards. Onwards yeah. and forwards. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Very cool. Let's be in touch. Yeah. Okay.